So for me, women's human rights are violated on a daily basis and everywhere. That is during normal times and during disasters and the pandemic, it gets worse because people forget about women's rights. We are told it's on the back burner because there are more important things to look at. So, you know, what happens is that while we have uh, issues of violence against women, we have issues of women's access to justice, we have issues of women's employment and things like that, uh, all the time in normal times, so-called normal times, during these times, I would say every issue is an emerging issue. And more so with uh, you know, women losing their jobs, uh, women being the first to let go, uh, employers taking advantage of them uh, by, you know, if you want a job, then you work the long hours, but you have to take a pay cut. You know, they lose a lot of their uh, benefits and so on. So, uh, and uh, you know, sexual harassment increases. We see she's at home. Uh, because of all the COVID protocols, there has been an escalation in the violence they are suffering. Uh, girls are reporting uh, increased uh, sexual harassment. We are also looking at online violence and we don't have the, the, uh, the, the protections for people who are going through this. So yes, this is a bad time and, uh, and, uh, and also while there are many, many policies and legislation, which I will talk about in a little while. Uh, they all get lost because the pandemic becomes of the utmost importance. And uh, for many people, it's easier to let go of women's rights than of any other rights. And that's the, the first ones that usually go. So, um, so you know, government, government uh, uh, commitment to women's rights, all the fancy words when we are launching the national action for uh, the prevention of violence against women, when we are launching the service delivery protocol, when we are launching government's uh, toll-free 24-hour line, all the fancy words, all the right words that need to be said, they just go under the carpet. And that is what we are seeing. So it's really imperative that we have a very strong women's movement a feminist women's movement, I must say, that keeps track and keeps monitoring and ensures that whenever there is a pushback, we push back also. So that takes a lot of energy out of a movement. Fiji has got a strong women's movement, unfortunately, that there are very few of us who are activists and feminists because, uh, you know, and, and given the political situation in our country, there is a lot of fear. So I have seen good women who have done tremendous work get, keep a lower profile because of the vindictive, vindictiveness of, this, of the present regime and what can happen to them. So human rights defenders, women's human rights defenders are you know, under the, uh, on the radar all the time and so they have to go sometimes under the radar and perfectly understanding but it makes the work difficult for those of us who are monitoring and pushing back all the time. So having said that, uh, you know, we have to look at the history. I would like to have a look at the history of how as a feminist activist and, and belonging to the feminist women's movement and belonging to uh, the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre uh, the, the, the kind of things we have done in the past and we need to and we need to review that and we need to bring that back and with you know with the with the with the cyberspace with the internet with the you know all this with the technology we can also enhance the kind of lobbying and advocacy that we have done before so um, you know let's start with the the changes that have come about when I first started this work with the crisis center first came into in, into being in 1984, that is the mid-1980s, and I joined in 1985, uh, you know, there was so much work to be done. There was some work that had already been done uh, by the YWCA when that had a group of very feminist women who had looked at the rape laws and they had documented what was wrong with it. So that was something that we could start with. We listened to the women, we listened to the women, um, you know, uh, uh, most of our work comes from the experiences of women. So the crisis center, because we were, we were a counseling organization for 
uh, for women who were survivors of violence against women, rape, domestic violence, sexual harassment. We were able to listen to their stories and find out more, you know, based on their experiences, what was wrong. So all our advocacy and lobbying came out of women's experiences of violence, of human rights violations, how how were they treated when they accessed the services? How were they treated by police? How were they treated in the courts? What what was wrong with the with the, with the law? And we found out a lot. You know, the past sexual harass uh, experience of women uh, of women was brought in as evidence if they said they had been raped. Um, we we had the law of corroboration. It was it was it was the onus was on the woman to prove that she was raped and not on the perpetrator, not on the rapist. So we knew there was, you know, there was a lot of things wrong there. So we started lobbying. So we not only did the counseling, we went into the communities, we started lobbying at a higher level. And, you know, it's also good, you know, we have in the Pacific, in Fiji, the one talk system. So I was at university, I was, you know, I graduated in the 70s. So a lot of my colleagues were in uh, important positions of power. So I would call them out on all of these things and tell them this is happening. I could phone and so on. And that is the beauty of being in the Pacific because we're smaller, we know each other, we can use our kinship uh, relations, relationships and all those things to, and, and we have to be shameless to do that, you know, and, 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 and because we're doing it for all of us, not for me personally, but for all of us. And I, I'm quite shameless around that. I'm quite shameless in looking for funds in fundraising for the organization. Uh, even though I have been put down for that before, but I continue doing that. So, you know, using all these people, I found out where all these people were in government, who was a lawyer, who was where, 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 and then we found that out. So I'd give them a call, you know, and say hello, and you know, this is how you start. You get to know politicians, you get to know their spouses. At that time, we didn't have many women's, uh, women uh, politicians, so we got to know the male politician spouses and we might have been at school to with them at primary school or secondary school or even university. So you start, you know, getting them to get interested in things. You lobby wherever you can. Your church people that you know, your religious people that you know, talk to them about these issues. So we started talking about women's issues and about violence against women, about the lack of support we were getting. We talked to people who were lawyers and who were in the judiciary uh, about the head of the Legal Aid Commission and all this, talking to them about what was wrong with the laws and so on. So having said all of that, we also had a sister organization that we gave birth to in 1986, 86, that is the Fiji Women's Rights Movement. So the, 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 the role of the Fiji Women's Rights Movement was to, to, we would bring all the problems up and they were the ones who were going to you know, um, analyze these things and, and write policies, uh, draft policies and things like that. And then we would lobby together for the changes in the law and so on. So, um, in, uh, so that is how the Family Law Act came about. And it was led by, of course, Imrana Jalal. Uh, we had also, you know, a con it, it became a bit contentious because the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, because we dealt with women on the ground, we knew the number of de facto relationships there were and how men would leave women of, uh, you know, 15 years of marriage, uh, living together 16 years, 20 years, and run off with younger women and leave the woman and children with nothing. And, you know, the, uh, those relationships, common law relationships were not uh, recognized at that time. So we really pushed for that. And they, there was a rift between the FWRM and FWCC at that time, uh, because FWRM's view was that uh, let's just go for this and get this first and then we'll lobby for the others. We said, no, women are suffering right now. We put everything together, you know, because, and the crisis center has learned that, and, and, and some very good people, uh, families from overseas and uh, overseas have taught me that when you want something, you go for the whole hog. You put everything in, then you might get three quarters or half of that. If you just go, you start minusing this and minusing that, and, and then you just go for the half, you might get half of that. So we have always believed in going for the whole hog. So when you're lobbying and advocating, go for the whole hog. Well, we missed out on that. We did make a submission, but uh, uh, you know, the, the Family Law Act, which is a great act, and you know, but we all supported it. You know, we always have these kind of rifts, rifts we, even within the feminist movements. But in the face of all the problems women have, 
all the human rights violations, we come together very quickly also, you know? So wounds heal very quickly in the feminist movement because the, 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 the focus is promoting women's human rights and ensuring that they don't get violated. So anyway, so that happened. And I kept on talking and the present attorney general who is a past friend of mine, a former friend of mine, very good friend. So he was part of the movement with us. And uh, so, uh, you know, in I think 2009, in 2009, uh, I got a call from him and he said, so I kept talking to him even, you know, during this time about the defector and what difficulties we're having in men paying maintenance for children and so on. And he realized that there was, we had talked about it before. So I got a call from him and he said, we're going to recognize defector relationships. So, so that's how. You know, another thing, you know, you, keep, you never stop talking about it. You keep talking, talking, you use your friendships, whichever camp they belong to. And if they are in power, you get them to do things. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, um, and of course, as long as, uh, you know, they are not killing off people and, you know, committing genocide and things like that. So you can partner with people, even though you might not like their ethics and, you know, and, and things like that. So anyway, so we got that going. Then Fiji Human Rights Movement, Fiji Human Crisis Center, Penny Moore, who the, the, the who is the late Penny Moore? She did a lot for the rape laws and so on. We did a huge lobby around that to change the past sexual history should not be admitted. The rapist should be the one who should be held responsible for the rape and not the woman. Uh, um, law of corroboration. We talked about all of that. So that was drafted by I think it was uh, a former judge uh, Mary Pulea and the former. Um, as Chief Justice uh, Tony Gates, I think, I think there was, a, if I remember correctly, other people might, uh, might know better, but, uh, uh, but they, so we had that done, you know, so that done, but then it was shelved, you know, all these things were done and shelved. We had an Australian volunteer who was a lawyer with us, and uh, together with us and other lawyers that we knew who were working with us, we managed to draft a domestic violence law, be a bill. And we submitted that to the to the Law Reform Commission, to the DPP's office, and so on. And that was that was I would say back in 1995-1996. We kept lobbying for the a separate domestic violence bill that we really needed that that it could not come under the 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 penal code, the you know the normal one. Uh, what do you call this? Um, sorry, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know these things. But I, I don't have the right words for it. But it's about uh, uh, about uh, causing actual body bodily harm or common assault and things like that. And the penalties just were not there. When women reported domestic violence, they were treated very badly, and they hardly saw the light of day in court. And so we really lobbied. We kept lobbying, and we said there was a draft that we had done, and so on. So we lobbied the Law Reform Commission. There were people there who were very, very uh, open to those discussions and so on. So the, you know, so that was brought out and sort of formed. Uh, uh, even though maybe governments might not uh, admit to that, but th that formed the basis of the Domestic Violence Act that we have. So we worked on it. The the we worked through the. Um, GBV task force, the uh, Ending Violence Against Women, EVO task force, Ending Violence Against Women and Girls task force that was formed in 1999, 2000. And then, uh, you know, we, we, and at that time we started working, the Law Reform Commission was a member of that task force. It was made up of government and CSOs, different government ministries, including the AG's office, the Law Reform Commission, Ministry for Women led it. And that is still a task force that is going strong. Uh, but so, uh, so that was revived, and there was a huge consultation that took place around uh, domestic violence. We were part of it. A staff of ours was invited to go with the delegation and do the awareness and so on, just like we're doing for the NAP at the moment, and so on. And then we got the, and so again, it was drafted, again shelved, till this present Fiji First government came in, then dusted off the the you know the, the the documents again and brought it into being with a few changes with a lot of changes because our the ones that we knew about was not gender neutral we're still having that argument about having gender neutral laws because people don't recognize the gendered aspect of violence against women so it was then um, uh, you know uh, again gender neutral 
few of those things, but the DVROs and all those, is, you know, it's a real good law. The only problem is it, it, it's, uh, it's gender neutral and we need to review that. But, so we have that, we have the um, uh, Crimes Act, this government also bring that, brought that into, the, into, into action and uh, revived that and that has been brought into action so we no longer have the past sexual history, the coral law of corroboration and so on. But we have all these wonderful, wonderful laws here, uh, you know, but it, it doesn't always protect women. We all fall down at the implementation stage and that is why the crisis center is in an excellent place because we deal with women, the women who come through us and we know exactly what they suffer when they are using these laws and so on, how, you know, we don't have the, uh, the, the DVROs while that is there to protect women because people don't understand the gendered aspect of domestic violence, of rape and so on. Uh, they think that anyone can suffer from domestic violence and so on. They don't look at the data and things like that. So women are having a lot of difficulties. First in accessing it, the old attitudes and uh, the mindsets about women, why the domestic violence is a norm. If you're married, you go with it. So that still exists. And, and uh, you know, and, uh, and we uh, continue our lobbying. That still exists. So when women go to the police station and so on, the police think that it's very trivial. They don't even recognize that women die, that most of the cases that are coming uh, to them uh, on ass uh, uh, peop uh, people complaining about assault uh, uh, is, is of women who are getting assaulted. And if you look at the data, that is very clear. It's more women getting assaulted and often at the hands of the men. So, you know, that, that recognition is still not there. So, yeah, so, so that is what, um, you know, the way we lobby and the lobbying and advocacy is everywhere that we can, people that we know. Now we have got the EVO task force, we've got the GBV working group, we have got the national action plan for the prevention of all forms of violence against women and girls and so on. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, there are all these now um, formal setups through which we can lobby. But for the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, it doesn't stop there. We lobby everyone. We're taking it out in the communities. We are also getting the communities that we work in to take ownership of these things and to report violations and so on. So we are able to talk to the uh, police commissioner. We can talk to the legal aid commission. We can talk to the AG when he talks to me. So, and so, so you know, so we can do that. We can text and all those. So, uh, but so therefore lobbying and advocacy is very, very important. When talking about human rights of women, we cannot take a rest. Feminists don't take a rest. We cannot rest on our laurels. We must look after our health and so on, but we must, we must, we have to continue monitoring. We have to continue raising our voices because it's very easy for women's human rights to take a backseat despite all the policies, all the legislation, all the awareness that we do and you know because we are questioning patriarchy and that is the hard yard so that is the story of the crisis center and how we did the lobbying and advocacy and brought about the changes and so on